coming next is my honor to invite Yunia Bignova, founder of Signify Global Product Sourcing. And Yunia today will share with us two important projects on optimizing sourcing through new shoring and the quality control and assuring strategy for diverse global supply chains. Everyone, please welcome Yunia. Welcome. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is, I forgot my name. I'm, I'm the last one of the day, so we can stay here for three hours instead of the next 30 minutes. Uh, coffee, champagne, snacks, everything around us. So um, for those of you uh, who don't know what nearshoring is, are there actually any people who know what nearshoring is? You're nodding your head. So, can you tell us what is nearshoring? Nearshoring means that um, very close, near the boundary. Near the boundary. We can say it in such way. So, um, let's put it this way: nearshoring is making your products as close to the point of sale as possible. There are like different definitions, but this is how I look at it. So, for example, I am a brand owner with two brands. Uh, for the last 10 years, the first brand is, was, was all made in China. Later on, we diversified that and we started manufacturing it in China, in India and in Germany. The second brand, which we launched about three years ago, it's all made in Germany. The reason is because we sell in Germany. So we try to get all of the advantages of the proximity as much basically as possible. Um, I myself have been working in product sourcing and supply chain for the last 19 years. I spent about nine years living in China, then in Singapore, and currently I'm based out of Germany for the last seven years. Um, we work with many different customers across the globe, people who are just trying to start their business and they come to global sources to find their first product, or we also work with customers like Amazon. So we help them with their product sourcing across the globe. Uh, first, before we go into the near shore in itself, it's extremely important to note a few things for 2024. We're already into April, soon into May, but we need to understand that 2024, you know, you know when Corona was finished and everybody was happy and everybody, oh, I'm gonna go travel and I live my life and my, my sales are gonna skyrocket and then everything went to hell because this war started, that war started and you know, not fun. So in any case, the information that I'm providing on this and on the next slide is specifically has been collected by the top consulting companies in the world. It's not me going and asking around. It's the big, the, KP, the KPMG, the PW and the rest of them, right? So in general, when we're looking at the transportation costs in 2024, uh, we are supposed to see a general decrease throughout the year. Even with everything that we're seeing around, the decrease, the decrease is due to decrease in demand for transportation. A few years back, a few years back, you had a lot of containers that were being shipped from China, right? But they were never shipped back. So China had huge demand just for the 20 and 40 high cube containers, but they had nothing because nobody was shipping back from US. So the prices skyrocketed. Right now we have oversupply of many different items across the globe because people are still selling off the stuff that they acquired during the pandemic when they're like, oh my God, instead of making $10,000 a month, I'm right now making a million. And I actually know people like this. And now a lot of them are sitting with the stock that they cannot sell because, you know, you don't buy face masks in Europe anymore, right? For example. So in general, decrease in the um, fuel prices because the demand is lower. Logistic and shipping rates, on the other hand, right? It, it should be kind of connected. If we're seeing decrease in the fuel prices, we should be seeing decrease in the transportation costs. No. 
You know, every time you watch the news and, oh my God, the oil per barrel has dropped by 20%, but you go to your gas station and the price has increased by 20%, then you're thinking, what the hell? Right? Um, it's the taxes. It's, it's, it's the whole combination of many things. In this case, the shipping and transportation rates are extremely affected by what is happening in the world. For example, originally I come from Russia. Right? Obviously there is a war, flights, trains, planes, everything, big problem. There are further problems in the shipping in the sea freight industry that I will tell you a little bit more about later. But all of that in total shows an increase in the transportation prices. In general, it's not only from China, it's from other countries as well. I give you an example. If you're manufacturing your products currently in Turkey, the prices are going up. You know why? Not because of the war, not be because of the demand. A lot of people who sell their products in Europe, they don't want to produce in China anymore. They're moving their manufacturing to Turkey. So Turkey has such a high demand for manufacturing and transportation, you know, that the demand rises, raises the cost of the supply. Inventory costs. If you're looking at companies like Amazon, for example, if you are selling on Amazon or planning to sell on Amazon, in 2024, they have introduced some very interesting new fees for storage. Oh, hello. That's interesting. <laughs> I need one of those for, uh, for presentations. So uh, the, in general, the storage costs, they're increasing. Whether you are using Amazon or you're using a 3PL in the US or in Europe somewhere. So there is a really, really cool thing that you can do which is called drip shipping. So you're dripping your inventory in. So the companies who hold your inventory, for example, if you're manufacturing in China, they hold your inventory and they make a forecast on how off, based on your previous sales, right? Or based on the sales of your competition, on how often do you need to drip ship? Because your storage costs will be lower and you will not have overstock and you will not have to pay additional fees to Amazon or to anybody else. So there are quite a few services out there, not only in China, but across Asia, Europe and other countries as well. So drip sh not drop shipping, but drip shipping. So, and you need to definitely look at, is your product still worth selling? I give you a wonderful example of my wonderful husband. Uh, my husband is the type of person who needs to have an emotional connection to the product. So he will live under a bridge before he will give up on the product. That is like, like the, I need to pull him out and say, you are losing money. You are losing, I don't know, $100,000 per month. Oh, but you know, maybe the change will come and this will, and it will be great. No. It's been three years. You can buy a house with the amount of money you lost. So you need to become, you need to be realistic. When you're selling something, and it doesn't matter where you're selling, you need to make sure that you're actually making money. Amy, you sell on Amazon. Uh, does anybody here sell on Amazon actually? A few people, okay. So, um, it actually doesn't matter if you sell on Amazon or you have your own e-commerce store or you sell in retail. Most of the people, they don't know how much money they're actually making. When I talk to some, do you sell already? You're selling, okay. So um, when you are talking to other people who also sell online, you guys ask each other uh, like, so what's your revenue, right? right. So, and your revenue can be a million dollars or it can be $20 million. And you tell these people, yeah, I made 20 million last year. <laughs> really? What's your profit? Oh, I got a call. I got to go. <laughs> you see this all the time because people, first of all, they're afraid to face how much they're actually making and they're afraid to make those calculations. I was one of those people. Right? When uh, I kind of joined my husband in the Amazon e-commerce business, we also sell our products in retail. 
And I said, we need to look at the numbers. He's like, oh, I'm busy today and for the next three months. I'm like, no, we sit down and we look at it. And we saw that we're making barely anything. We're breaking even. We are recycling money. There is no point for you to, what is the point, right? Then you might as well go get a job, uh, like in US especially, make $200,000 per year. You are not worried about anything. Your insurances are paid, your house is paid, you got dental insurance and all of those things. What is the point of constantly worrying and getting yourself just insane and crazy? And again, business owner, so constantly insane and crazy, never sleep properly. So, <clears throat> A few other things to look in 2024. Production costs. We have certain materials across the globe that are used mo more and most in comparison to others. So let's say wood, let's say pulp, right? Pulp is uh, something that is used to um, have paper made or packaging or toilet paper. Um, let's say metal, aluminum, etc., etc. If you look at the predictions for 2024, it is the general consensus that the prices for the raw material will drop. And to be open and honest, because we also look at the purchasing prices of different raw materials, they are dropping, right? So if you are producing a, uh, a wooden stand, let's say you pay, I don't know, $10 for it, right but you're seeing that the material costs are decreasing right now then this can be a wonderful opportunity for you to renegotiate with your manufacturer when your manufacturer comes in every single time oh i need to raise the price right have you ever gone to your manufacturer and say oh i need to lower my price i've been working with you for 10 years i need something better i need innovation i need better pricing so in general, we see the decrease in the raw material. Labor costs, it's very good for the labor, for the people who work at the factories, for the people who work in the office. In general, the labor costs will be increasing across the globe due to inflation. Um, I live in Germany. In Germany, you have a very, very strong uh, workers union. We had strikes almost every day where there were no trains, no planes, no airport stuff working for months and months. Those guys asked for 450 euro monthly salary increase, one time fee of 3000 euros and tons of other things, right? And this is just for Germany. Other countries, Turkey, China, they're having similar things, not with a strong union, but in general, the you know, the costs are increasing. Supply chain disruptions, we kind of already talked about this a little bit. You got war, pandemic is over, next one's probably around the way, you know, you never know. So I need to be careful with this. Political instability, right? We all like going and voting and electing our honest and wonderful leaders who bring us forward. Um, one of the biggest concerns right now, especially if you sell in US, is if, uh, Trump is going to be re-elected. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard or not, but uh, Trump has announced that he would like to put a 10% import tax on every item that comes from China and up to 60% 60, 60 tax on some of the other products. That means it's a no-go for China anymore, right? You need to search for alternative sources, especially if you're selling in the US. The general regulatory compliance. I give you an example. If you sell cosmetics, right? Cosmetics in general is not an easy category to sell, but all of the countries, they're pumping up their regulatory compliance because they want to be more eco-friendly. They want to make sure the labor is not child labor, that you're not breathing toxic fumes or anything like this. So compliance in general is going up, which is good for you if you are compliant, if you're actually doing everything you're supposed to do. If not, then your competition will take over and they will basically win. So, supply chain diversification, extremely important in 2024. 
meaning you need to have multiple manufacturers in different countries. If you can't yet go to a country that is not China, at least diversify within the country. Again, a personal example of one of our products that has a little bit of electronics inside, so currently we can't, because of the complexity of the product, we can't produce it in India or in Vietnam. But we have three different factories in three very different locations in China where we know who their suppliers are of the PCB board, of the microchips, etc., etc. that it all comes from different places. Because if something goes wrong again, I can jump to one of the other factories, right? Because one can be banned by the US, but another one might stay open, right? So a good example of this is a garlic, um, garlic industry in the United States. 85% uh, of all of the garlic in the United States come from China. And it comes from three different manufacturers. It's sold out under all of the brands, McCormick, blah, 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 whatever. But it comes from three manufacturers. And the government said to the, uh, to the brands, guys, this is illegal. You need to find more manufacturers. You need to diversify because this is monopoly. They're like, oh yeah, we did, we did. So at the end, they paid huge, huge penalties for basically, you know, building a monopoly on the US market. Working on your uh, bill of materials together, this is extremely important. It doesn't matter if you're doing this in China, if you're manufacturing your products in China or you're manufacturing your products in Germany. You need to come to your manufacturer and say, look, you wanna make money, right? I wanna make money, good. Let's make money together. If you explain to the manufacturer that, guys, this is the product, I'm buying this for $2, I'm selling this for 15, and the manufacturer is gonna go, oh my God, you're making so much money. No, because I also spend money on shipping, on advertising, on paying taxes, etc., etc. So you need to explain to them your business and you can discuss later on the bill of material. In the bill of material, you will be able to see not only the cost of the material involved, but how much your manufacturer is actually spending on labor, right? A lot of manufacturers are very much afraid of showing you the bill of material because they're gonna say, oh, you're gonna take away my margin. But this is where the partnerships come in and you need to communicate with them and explain to them, guys, I don't wanna take away your margin, I wanna find a different way where we can both make a lot more money. So. Plan ahead for a full year, make annual contracts with manufacturers. Annual contracts with manufacturers are possible both in China and outside of China. This is basically when you talk to them and say, hey guys, within the year 2024, I'm going to order 10,000 pieces of this clicker, right? You sign the paper, you don't pay all the money ahead. But you say, on my first order, I'm gonna pick up just 2,000 pieces and you get the 2,000 pieces. On your second order, you put, take another 2,000 pieces, etc., etc. This way you can get the better price because they will purchase all the raw material together, right? So they get better price, you get better price. So now on to the nearshoring. If you're purchasing your products um, in China, and for example, you're selling them into the US, there are a few ways the goods actually uh, take their way to get uh, to the United States. You have the Trans-Pacific Route, which is the most uh, commonly um, using uh, route that is um, used, right? You have the Panama Canal Route, which is pam pam pam, is in very, very big trouble right now because it has no water. And if it has no water, the ships don't go through it, right? And uh, you, of course, have the Suez Canal route. And unfortunately, there is a war going on in that region. So this is affecting the prices to the extreme everywhere, right? Because of this, just simply because of this, because of the so many things coming together right now, the drought in the Panama Canal, the war in the Suez Canal, uh, in general, the seas, 
right? On the other routes are becoming more rough and more ships are being capsized. Just the combination of factors literally this year, at the start of the last year, but literally already this year, this should bring you towards nearshoring, meaning trying to manufacture your products as close as possible to the point of where you actually sell, right? So there is nearshoring, there is onshoring, offshoring, reshoring, right? But the most important for you, it, 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 the terms, they don't really matter, right? The point being is you need to bring your manufacturing as close to the point of sale as possible. Okay, I can't go through that whole slide <laughs> because it's a lot, but <clears throat> these are things that you will face when you are doing nearshoring, realistically, right? So the things in black are kind of your positive things, kind of your advantages. The things in red are disadvantages. So let's say you're selling your products in uh, Germany, right? And I would like to find a manufacturer in Germany. I speak German, they speak German, hooray, wonderful. They're on the same time zone, awesome. I can drive there, well, or take a train if they're not on strike, wonderful. So many different things, response, culture. But at the same time, it can be absolutely completely different thing. Again, for example, Ariel, where do you want to sell your products? In the United States? Yes, but everywhere. But yes, but everywhere. Okay. But you want to start selling your products in the United States, right? Yes. Okay. So do you think Mexico can be a good country for you for near shoring? Maybe. Yeah. Why? Maybe they have the raw materials and can get it to me a little bit easier. These are valid, definitely advantageous examples, but all of the people who are starting an e-commerce business and are trying to go to Mexico, I'm telling them no. Don't do it. <laughs> it's very hard. Do you speak Spanish? Okay, do you speak Spanish enough to communicate with the manufacturers? Okay, Amy, how many people in Mexico actually speak English? Um, only about 10%. And how many of those people actually speak English fluently? I don't, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Yet. I've actually looked at the statistics. Only about 7% of the population in Mexico can speak English fluently. So if you don't speak Spanish, if you don't understand the local culture, it doesn't matter if you want to go to Mexico or not. You need to find ways to work on it. You can hire people on Upwork, for example. You can hire consultants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This all can be wonderful opportunities. But you need to weigh your pros and cons, right? We went to Germany because we can speak German. My husband is German, right? He understands the culture. He is a man. The manufacturer is also a man. It's not like, oh, she's a woman. I'm not going to work with her, but. A man in Europe of the age of over 55 who's been in the business for some time, they see a woman from another country and they're like, yeah, 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 you know everything. You're good, you're good, right? And like, they kind of discount you a little bit. I'm sorry, but that is still the case. We're fighting this and it's okay and we know how to deal with this. But you know, man to a man sometimes works better. I mean, also depends on the woman. So you definitely need to look at the pros and cons, and this is a good list for you to take in and to say, right, okay, I wanna manufacture like this, I can still right now manufacture in Vietnam already, right? So I need to see what are the pros and cons. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing you need to look at is of course your landed cost. What is a landed cost? Can you tell me? So cost of production, shipping, uh, tariff on the port, including storage. That is landed cost. Wonderful, perfect. Most of the people, not most, okay, a lot of people, they're not actually even aware what is the landed cost. Thank you, five minutes. I still have half an hour after that, so. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but yeah, landed cost includes absolutely everything. I'm gonna show you, here is a very good example of an actual product, of an actual customer, right? Uh, that is not the customer brand, that is just the product, right? If you have children, you know what this is. It's, uh, 
you put it in the kitchen and your kid stands with you and cuts off his fingers or sorry cuts potato tomato and all of those things right so in the United States, those things actually sell very well and they're double the price of what you can sell them for in Germany. So the same product in Germany sells for half the price, right? We had a customer who used to purchase this product in China. And uh, they used to purchase this product for $37. The prices, right, the numbers that you see in here, they're not landed cost. They're the purchasing price they're basically FOB, right? They're FOB. So the customer came and said, um, you know, it's the pandemic. Shipping is getting expensive, $17,000 per container. Our goods are semi-heavy, semi-large. We need different options because they were paying way, way too much. So we started looking at different opportunities of how the person can optimize their costs, right? And this is the point. Before you do nearshoring, meaning bringing the manufacturing as close to you as possible, you need to consider the landed cost first. Because you need to see with which of the countries, for example, you have very good trade agreements. Like Mexico and US has a very good trade agreement. You have Canada and US, have good trade agreements. With, if you're purchasing from Europe and you're bringing stuff into the United States, you have very, very good trade agreements as well. So you need to consider this. For this particular customer, we went to Turkey, Poland, Mexico, and Bulgaria. This, these are the actual prices that we found for that product, right? In terms of manufacturing. Ariel, which country do you think the customer has selected to manufacture his product in? Probably China. No, no, no. He wanted to go away from China. Okay, so, uh, where is he located? He's, that's a smart, right? He's selling in the United States of America. So, maybe Mexico. But that's very high. What about you? Yeah, China might be also an option. Depends on the landed cost, pros and cons of every single country. Uh, hopefully made a spreadsheet of what the numbers are and then decided where to bring it. Exactly. But the point being is the customer selected the most expensive option, which is Mexico, which is 70, uh, 47 US dollar. There, it's, it's higher in uh, manufacturing costs on his first order of about 2,000 pieces. Later on, the prices basically dropped to almost $40. Right, because he kept ordering more and more and more. But his import taxes are non-existent. His delivery time from the moment he places an order from mass production to the moment it arrives in the warehouse took about 25 days. Right, 25 days. This is manufacturing and shipping included. Right, meaning his financials are in a lot better state because you invested in 25 days later, you already have money coming in. Exactly, right? So, in this case, the customer has selected the most expensive choice when it comes to the actual uh, manufacturing. Sorry? <laughs> so, um, here are some products that can be produced in different countries, in different locations across the globe. Um, it, like, if you look at the global sources, right? We're here in Hong Kong. You have, many, you have of, of course, a lot of manufacturers from China. But I know for a fact that global sources, they're going to Indonesia, right? Global sources, they're going to Vietnam, right? What is the reason? We all know the reason, right? We need to avoid the taxes. We need to grow our manufacturing base. They might be going to other countries as well. Why? Because there is demand and the demand is growing and you can produce so many different products across the globe. Again, cosmetics, supplements, chemicals. Um, one of my favorite, favorite categories that can be sold like a special, I, I wanna bring one of those and start selling it specifically in Asia are household cleaning products from Germany. Because it's from Germany. Clean your toilet with, with a cleaner from made in Germany. You know, all of those things, the chemicals, right? We have BASF, the largest chemical manufacturer in the world that is a city in Germany, in Ludwigshafen. 
So these are some items that can be produced in Europe and in the Americas. These are some items that can be produced in Latin America. So if you're selling in the United States, for example, or even Canada, these are some of the countries you can definitely consider. Um, even electronics, right? Electronics, be a little bit more careful because the capabilities uh, are still not up to snuff in comparison to China or to Vietnam or even to India. We, for example, have transferred a lot of our customers outside of China to India. Uh, we took the molds out, uh, we took the, like, the know-how, electronics, development and all of those things. Here is another one, also for Latin America. Furniture, wine, agricultural products, uh, textiles. Again, the list and possibilities are endless. You just kind of need to, yeah, to use it, to, 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 to Google. And uh, one of the great ways to actually potentially find manufacturers and which products are produced in certain countries is a website called Import Yeti. Import Yeti, Y-E-T-I. Uh, it's uh, created by this American guy, uh, Dave, uh, really smart, really geeky. He accumulated this huge database. He stepped in into like customs database in US and things like this. And the data is for free, right? And he says he will never start charging for it or anything like this. Yeah, here is another list, right? Uh, uh, we, I can just, like, for the next hour, I can just show the lists and things like this. Um, again, cosmetics, plastics, knives. Uh, like, I love knives from uh, Japan. I love knives from Germany, right? Uh, especially, you always have um, a level of people who will buy the cheapest stuff. The cheapest stuff. But you also have a level, a target group of people who will pay more money to buy more expensive things, right? And it's perfectly okay. Uh, yeah. Um, James, I can talk about quality control if you guys switch me. Is that the next one? Yeah? Uh, do I click through? La, 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 la. Sorry. I will take another maybe 15 minutes of your time to talk about quality control uh, if anybody wants to listen because that's on the schedule. And I then at the end, I will get a pretty little glass, beautiful placard that I can take back with me to Germany. <laughs> um, quality control is something extremely important. Um, I told you that me and my husband, we have two brands. And one of the brands, it has existed for the last 10 years. For some of the products, we're still using the same manufacturers that we used 10 years ago. But every time we're placing an order for mass production, be it once a month, be it once every two months, we still have a quality control after every single order. Right? Ariel, you're, you're my go-to lady today. Why do you think, if I am working with the manufacturer for the last 10 years, why am I checking, why am I doing quality control of every single order? couple of reasons. It could be your commitment to the customer, but also things can change. What things? The people who are making your product. There you go. This is exactly correct. <clears throat> Especially we need to understand this if you're working with manufacturers in Asia. Right? In Asia, we have uh, Chunjie, we have the Chinese New Year, uh, we have the Tomb Sweeping Festival, we have in October the party, we have the uh, Mooncake Festival and all of those things. People go home and they never come back. The recent statistics has shown that Chinese manufacturers have about 70% turnover of their stuff on the floor, on the production floor. So 100% of stuff leaves for Chinese New Year and only 30% of them come back. The rest of them, they don't come back. They find the job maybe closer to where they actually live. So every, especially if you have an order coming in right after Chinese New Year, double down on your quality control because you have a lot of new workers at the factory, meaning they haven't been trained. Anybody, like it doesn't matter if you're working um, as a, uh, on a production floor or you're a sales manager. The point is you need time to learn. You need time to get used to things and to understand things. So 
these are the basic things that you kind of need when you're trying to place an order for mass production. This is for those who have never placed an order before, right? You need to identify what you actually require, right? The less specific, specific, ah, the less specificity, excuse me, you have, the harder it will be for a manufacturer to actually deliver what the hell you want, right? If I come to you and I say, I would like to produce glasses that are jacket that are blue and yellow. So it, it's a mix of words. So when you're coming to the manufacturers with a mix of words, how are they, if you don't know what you want to manufacture, how are they supposed to know what you would like to manufacture? So identify your needs as much as possible, even even if you're not 100% certain that these are the current specifics that you want to use on that product. You can change that in the future. That's perfectly fine. Supplier selection is a big process. It's a whole other story. My suggestion is when you're um, trying to find a manufacturer in China, talk to about 30 manufacturers, not three, not 13, 30, three, zero and narrow it down. This is a funnel that I've been using for 19 years successfully. If you're doing sourcing outside of China, if it's Vietnam, if it's Germany, if it's any other countries, double that number. Not because you're so cool and you like to talk people from abroad, but because it's a lot harder to find manufacturers outside. In China, you have global sources and other websites where you can go and da -da 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 filter. Ooh, I have my product, two minutes. Why do I need a sourcing agent? Why do I need an agency? I'm all ready. The trouble comes when you start ordering samples and negotiating. This is where the big trouble actually comes in. So you need to issue your purchase orders, order fulfillment, da, 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 da. So these are kind of the basic things. When it comes to reasons for quality control, they're extremely, extremely basic. You need to have a very good customer satisfaction. In today's day and age, look at how many, uh, James, how many, how many uh, manufacturers are actually exhibiting at the global sources? How many thousands? 4,000, more, 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 right? Thousand, thousands, that's a lot, right? There's a lot of competition. There is a lot of competition when it comes to selling your product. So you need to excel. So you really, really need to have a good satisfaction rate for your customers. Cost reduction, uh, reducing your costs, meaning not only, oh, I can negotiate better with my manufacturer, but meaning additional costs that come in when you screw up on your mass production. If something goes wrong, you're not selling your product, you're wasting your money, you need to redo things, you're spending, 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 you're not selling. Risk mitigation, that's obvious, so you, you, actually, you, know, you actually have a good manufacturer and you actually have good products. And compliance. Compliance, Amy was talking about this, right? She was like rechecking her patent and all of those things. Compliance in today's day and age, doesn't matter where you sell, it's a big thing. So you need to have a good manufacturer uh, and do quality control to have good compliance. The problems that you're facing when doing quality control, this is anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. Culture and regulations, right? Um, my colleagues have been kicked out, okay, uh, I have been kicked out out of a factory in China on numerous occasions because I actually check stuff. I used to see, I used to live in the city of Wenzhou, this is in Zhejiang province, this is the law, it's like the kingdom for shoes, for manufacturing shoes. And I used to work with a huge Russian company called Centro and I was helping them manufacture shoes. So you can imagine how many samples of shoes I had at home. They were not bribes, I was testing them, okay? I was just testing them. One time, we're at the manufacturing facility, the order is at about 30,000, 30,000 pairs of shoes. So you can imagine how many do we actually need to check. We had five quality control inspectors, standing like set up on the tables we had 
all of the work, not all, some of the workers from the factory. One is opening the box. Second one is taking shoes out of the box, like, like Japanese production line, but in reverse. And it comes to us fully opened. You take it, you check it, and all of those things. I have good peripheral vision. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a, shoe fly, a pair of shoes flying out of the window. They didn't have an opportunity to, like, you know, take it away and hide it under the table. He saw Ping. Uh, he saw, like, damaged goods. He just threw it out of the window behind him. We're like, what? What? He said, no, no, no. All okay. All good. No problem. No worry. All good. Wrong shoe. Wrong shoe. Wrong design. We look outside. Of course, these are our shoes. We go downstairs to pick them up. Quality is crap. Everything is stopped. Right? So you got to be careful. And this is the cultural difference. If I were to go to a manufacturer in Germany <laughs> or Portugal, right, where shoes are manufactured, for example, they would not even think of throwing something or hiding something. They're going to come to me and say, hey, we have problems over here. Give us some time. We will redo this. No problem. Right? Absolutely different mindset. Um, suppliers and uh, how variable they are. So, right, you need to have many different partners in your supply chain or not. The more partners you have in your supply chain or the more partners your manufacturer has in their supply chain, the more possibilities there are that something will go wrong. So, if I produce this jacket, there are two suppliers. There is the supplier of the actual material, right, raw material, and then there is the supplier who does the cut and saw. That's it. I got two guys. Maybe, uh, and I have a print on the inside rather than a paper sticker. Oh, wait, sorry, another one. OPP bag or something like this, right? So it all comes together one by one by one. The more you have, the more likely something is going to go wrong. So what we do is when we work with our manufacturers, we ask them who their suppliers are so we can check them as well. It's not always that they're actually are going to allow you to do this, but if you're building partnerships, it should be okay. Communication challenges. Ariel, do you speak Chinese? No, she doesn't speak Chinese. Do you speak Spanish? We already know this. Do you speak German? No. Try to go and find the manufacturer in France or in Poland and don't speak a local language. They can speak English, but they will not because they are very proud people. Let's put it this way. All right, types of the quality control. These are not fancy names. You can, if, you can Google, if you Google or go to Baidu or some other search engine, you can find fancy names for all of those things. So supplier audit is your quality control of the manufacturer before you actually start working with the manufacturer. You can look at their numbers. You can look at import Yeti, who's, who see who their customers are. You can see uh, what documentation they have for company registration. Uh, you can see if they have, for textiles, you have an OECOTEX, right? It's uh, like specifically a certification for textiles. A lot of Chinese manufacturers, unfortunately, will give you the certificate. But if you go online to check it, most likely it has expired. They're giving you this not because they're bad people. They, sometimes they simply forget to renew those things. And as soon as you will tell them, they're going to, oh, oh, two weeks later, everything's renewed. It's all perfect. So supplier audit even before you get to the manufacturers. The next stage is quality control on your sample. Please never, never take this away. I have seen, I don't know why, it's 21st century, it's 2024. If you want to order your product, you want to see it, you want to smell it, you want to taste it, put it in a washing machine, whatever the product does. You need to properly test your sample. And I don't mean test, oh, oh, that's pretty good. I'll order 2,000 pieces. No, you need to test it for several days. You need to give it to your friends, to your family. Basically, they will be doing A-B testing on this product for you. Um, a lot of people don't do manufacturing during the mass production, but if you have very complicated products with intricate designs or where multiple different uh, components from different materials come together, uh, mass production, uh, sorry, uh, quality control during mass production is better for you than the quality control after the mass production. Because if you have tiny little things that need to be caught during 
when it's done, most likely it can't be redone, needs to be thrown out, goodbye, thank you, I take your money, bye-bye, ding. After mass production, this is an obvious one, you go, you check everything during loading, right? Most of the people, they just come and they do uh, the quality control um, after the mass production. My suggestion, add $100 more to whoever agency you are using and make sure that the person who just did the quality control for you is standing there and loading the container. He's present there during the loading. So then neither the transportation company nor the manufacturer can claim, oh, we didn't do this. It was the bad weather out in the ocean or something like this, right? So again, 100 extra bucks and you have that security. You have that seal on your container. Not a problem. You can also do additional quality control in the warehouse, depending where your goods are stored. Uh, just random checks, just a little bit of additional things. Um, there is also one, every factory in the world, not only in China, but in many countries across the globe, you have a quality control person in the factory, right? Uh, you know, sometimes you buy Chinese products and they will have this tiny little white sticker, QC26, right? So this is an actual quality control person at the factory. Do they actually do quality control? That is a very big question. It's like with Kennedy, we never know what happened, right? So this is something you definitely need to consider. So um, prevention over the inspection. So this is why quality control, a good quality control of mass production, of having your details in place, this is prevention. So the manufacturers know what not to do, right? And lose the quality control throughout the process. Improvements, and you need to make data-driven decisions. So if you're selling a product, or if you're about to sell a product, for God's sake, go on Amazon, read some reviews, right? Um, I don't know, this, uh, these pants, sorry, I'm not picking on you, but uh, these pants are too beige or not beige enough or something like this. You need the data. I don't care, again, if you sell on Amazon or not, but you can use Amazon as your market research platform to see what the hell people are complaining about. This is your free market research for which people pay thousands of dollars, literally. So yes, tell her, go on Amazon, sit there, shop, buy, but at the same time, read reviews, and I guarantee you, you can use ChatGPT, right, to take the listing, put it in ChatGPT and say, read this listing and tell me what are the most common complaints. Can you do this? Just say yes. No. <laughs> Not yet. You did it. Oh, haha. -ha. Okay. And I think Chris, Ro Chris Rowland was also um, doing something like this. So yes, use this data. It's for free, right? People already paid for this. Um, yes, what to do? Backup suppliers, for sure. This is something, again, something important. The best option, the best reason for you to have a backup supplier, if you're selling like crazy. And this happens. We currently have a customer who sells on TikTok. He was losing weight. And people kept asking him, how are you eating, right? So he started like, you know, oh, I'll sell you my product so you know how I'm eating. So he's selling in thousands of the most common product you can find on Amazon, but he charges like triple the price of Amazon. He just sells through TikTok, right? And we needed to find him an additional supplier because the first one can't handle the volume anymore. So obviously that's the best reason. Uh, shorten supply chain, again, discuss your bill of materials with your manufacturer and give them some training. Right now, a lot of Chinese manufacturers are opening factories in Vietnam. What do you think they do? They send workers there. Not only they send fancy engineers and supervisors, they send workers who work on the machines to teach the Vietnamese local people how to work on those machines. You need to teach your manufacturers how to deal with your products as well. It's a lot simpler than it uh, you know, uh, sounds. Uh, so contracts that transfer risk. Make sure to put 
very good terms and conditions in your invoice, in your performer invoice, in your contract. For example, if the manufacturing is late by 30 days, the factory has to pay out the penalty of this many percent, etc., etc. Secure yourself. If the risk is spread between yourself and the manufacturer, manufacturer has a lot more willingness not to screw up. As simple as that develop SOPs, be like mama bird, or be like a helicopter parent, taka, 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 like all the time, in the beginning, right? Because you need to set up those standard operating procedures. Centralized communication, don't use 50 different methods, WeChat, WhatsApp, Viber, uh, Vape, whatever, right? One, stick with one. So you have all of the information, and in case you face trouble, you can easily find that information. And localization and outsourcing. If you are not present, if you, where do you live? US. So how often do you come to China? Not very often, okay. So find a person who can be your eyes on the ground, not maybe all the time, but in those rare cases when you need them. It's, it, it's okay to ask for help because the money you will spend on that person will probably save you like thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yes, I'm on time. <laughs> I assume everybody's tired and nobody has any question and everybody wants to drink champagne, right? It's not free. I think you got to pay for it. But uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, if you are, uh, we've created a list that has many different people and partners that we know. And it's like photography, uh, shipping, storage, blah, 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 blah. So if you want, uh, this is something we can share. We don't make any money on it or anything like this. Um, again, me and my husband, we're sellers ourselves. So we are kind of, we know how hard it is to sell, how much money people are actually making. So we're trying to kind of give back to the community a little bit. And if you want to talk to me or not, uh, you can always, uh, where's me? I'm not there. But my name is Yulia Blinova. My last name means pancake. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, I would always be um, happy to help and answer um, any of the questions you have. And I think, like Amy said, uh, guys, if you want to do something, you actually got to do it, right? Uh, stop wasting your time. Take that next step. Cry a little. Take another step. Cry a little more. You'll be fine. I've been doing it for 10 years. You'll be OK. You'll be fine. So yes, thank you. And I hope you're going to have a great time. Thank you, Yulia, for sharing. Yeah, yeah, I can. Sorry. Yeah, I can give the slides. Uh, if you email it, hello at zignified.net, ask for the slides. I can give you the slides for everything. That's not a problem. I'm out of voice. Sorry. Any questions? No. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very much.